Gantsoudis. My last name is spelled G-A-N-T-S-O-U-D-E-S. -E we are at the Atlanta History Center. Today is December the 19th, 2003. I uh, have here with me John W. Boys, who will tell us about um, his military service. John, would you repeat your name, spell your last name for me? and give us your date of birth. Okay. John W. Boyes, B-O-Y-E-S, born in Neptune City, New Jersey, on January 8th, 1927. John, thank you. Tell me something about Neptune City. I don't remember it because I didn't grow up there. <laughs> I grew up in Nyack, New York. Uh -huh. And that's a little town on the Hudson River, uh, about, it used to be 25 miles up from New York City. But they built a bridge over there, so it's only 19 miles now. Um, what else is uh, Nyack near of the Hudson River? It's uh, between New York City and West Point. In fact, we used to swim against the West Point team when I was in high school. And uh, it's in Rockland County, and Rockland County is full of rocks. That's why they named it that. Uh, can't think of other things other than up the river from where we lived is a big granite mountain that New York City has been cutting down for years and years to build New York City. Mm -hmm. um, tell me something about growing up in the area. Okay. Uh, Remember any sort of reminiscence from uh, grammar school? All right. Going into high school? Well, first I want to tell you, my father died when I was four years old. So my mother raised two boys. Right, tell me your father's name. Alexander H. Boys, born in Scotland. Tell me your mother's name. Uh, Josephine Iduna Boys. She was born in Neptune, in um, New Rochelle, New York. And you said you have uh, uh, one brother? One brother. And tell me his name. His name is Robert Boys. He lives in Middletown, New York. Um, is he an older or younger sibling? 17 months older. Tell me about, you said your father died when you were four. Right. And my mother, and that was sort of in the early days of the Depression. And she worked as cleaning houses, wherever she could. She was on welfare. Then finally she got a job as a waitress in the hospital restroom, uh, uh, dining room. And then when the war started, she got a job in the paper box factory to relieve men to go to war. Tell me what she did in the paper box factory. She worked what in was the, the name of the factory, do you remember? Uh, Gare Cartons. And uh, she worked in the egg safety department. That's where they put the egg boxes together that you put your eggs in. And in the old days, they were not like today's boxes. They had little sections in it. Mm -hmm. But that's what she did until yeah, she retired. the way those egg boxes looked. Yeah. Yeah, there was a, a piece that sort of slipped in at, right. at a 90 degree angle. Correct, yeah. And I worked down there, too, during high school. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, tell me something else about your high school days. Okay. Uh, you must have been a swimmer. You said you swam. Yeah, we swam. West Good Point, guys. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was also military-minded in those days, and I was captain of the school drill team, also a member of the rifle team. And in those days, you could carry a gun to school. You had to have the bolt out of the rifle. And you kept it till after school, and you went to the shooting range, and you fired your rifle. There was, we didn't have any problems with people trying to kill each other in those days. Mm -hmm. Not like today. Were you a good shot? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When I got in the military, I got my marksmanship medal. Mm -hmm. And, uh, okay, now, when I was 17 years old, I went down to New York, and that was January of 44, I went down to New York City and tried to enlist in the Marine Corps. And they told me, oh yeah, we'd love to have you, but you've got to get a note from your mother. I said, well, wipe that out, because that's not going to happen. So I went back home and went back to school and stayed there until graduation. But before graduation, the Army came in, and they gave us special tests for anybody who wanted to take it. I said, and I had a teacher that says, whenever you get a chance to take a test, take it. And I could care less about this test, so I took it. <laughs> and I passed it, I guess. Because then they wanted me to 
enlist in the Army and go to Army Specialized Training Reserve Program. So you enlisted rather than being drafted? That's right. Okay. So I enlisted, went down to New York City, passed all the tests. Then I graduated and I, in June 22nd. And how did your mom feel about you enlisting if you, she wasn't going to let you go when you were 17? Well, she knew I wouldn't go till after I got out of high school. Okay. So there was no problem so there. You, all right. Just checking on Mama. Right. And the military was sending me to Princeton University. So I graduated on June 22. July 5, I was in uniform at Princeton University. And naturally, they gave me pants that were too long because I didn't know anything about sizes of trousers. And I got a picture home there that showed a lot of uh, baggy pants. <laughs> but I finally got those fixed with the supply sergeant. Mm -hmm. Anyway, there I was at Princeton University taking engineering, basic engineering courses. And uh, I became a section leader. I had the section to march. We had to march to classes. And along with our Army Specialized Trade Reserve programs. They were Army Specialized program, uh, programs. They were above the reserve level. Then there was all these captains and colonels and brigadier generals studying to be government uh, leaders over in occupied Germany and France or wherever it might be. I guess they called them military government leaders. And then you had the normal uh, kids that went to, went to Princeton without the military. And so I stayed there for three quarters. Um, and was the military paying your tuition? Was it, was no, this like at, at, they paid the, Hill, or? They paid tuition and took care of food and board. Mm -hmm. And we had to take care of all other incidental expenses. Mm -hmm. And I stayed there for three quarters, which is in those days, it was an accelerated course. That's a year and a half, basically. And when you turned 18 years old, you finished out that quarter, and then you went into the Army. And so at that point in time, I went into the Army. And I passed all my grades while I Princeton. Had my, I still got my uh, transcript in my box at home. Um, all right, so. Uh so your, uh, your birthday is January. Right. So you turn 18 in January. Right. And you leave Princeton. Not until uh, March, April. April you left Princeton. Right. And where did you go next? April 15th. Well, they sent me in the, into uh, Fort Dix for induction into the Army, the regular Army. Where is Fort Dix? In New Jersey. Uh, and from there, they put us on a train going to training camp. And, they, and we didn't know where we were going, but we were going. What was the train ride like? Was the train ride? Soldiers? Oh, yeah. We, it was in April. The windows were open. All the smoke from the, the engine came in. All that. And we crowded into seats. Four guys to a seat, plus your duffel bag and everything else. And on the trip down there, the engine broke away from the main train. And left us rolling there, east down, way down there. The MPs quick got off the train to make sure nobody got out. <laughs> and then the engine backed up and picked us up. And I forgot what town we were in, somewhere, probably North Carolina or South Carolina. We were talking to people outside there. They said, Well, if you go on the right side, you're going to Georgia. If you go to the left side, you're probably going to Fort Bland in Florida. Well, we went on the right side. And we went to Camp Gordon, Georgia. And that was getting close to summertime. And where is Camp Gordon? Over in Augusta, Georgia. And they had everything at that camp. They had desert. They had swamps. They had woods. They had anything. And we went through all of them. But uh, we went in there. And again, I got a job as a squad leader, active squad leader. Always seem to get those things. And uh, we did all the training. And we were told it was going to be 10 percent of training casualties during our training period. But one time, what is what is training casualty? Somebody's going to get killed or hurt. Oh. Okay. <clears throat> but we were in a, a training area. We just had stacked our rifles and went to sit down in the bleachers 
and the sergeant says, take your arms. And we had to go back and in an orderly fashion. We didn't know what was going on. We took our arms. And suddenly some bazooka rounds come sailing in. And it hit one guy in the side of the head, took half his head away, and went over and hit another guy in the shoulder. And so, and I think they got one other guy with a bazooka round. But the sergeant says, take arms and take cover. And boy, did we tear out of that. And we all found cover. But <clears throat> they had named that as an impact area, but they failed to coordinate with the company that was using it, which is our company. And so somebody got in trouble, I don't know who it was. And the reason they were shooting these and these bazooka rounds was to demonstrate to a bunch of civilians who had bought war bonds, come and see what the Army was doing. So they said, we used to say, go buy a war bond and see a GI kill. Mm -hmm. And then <clears throat> another incident, we were in bayonet trading. And I just stick the bayonet at my buddy, Bet Lajewski. And he, I'm sorry, tell me your buddy's name? Uh, Ralph Betlajewski. And he'd come back, and he'd come back after me, and I'd take it away from him. Well, I was ready to lunge at him, and the sergeant says something, and Ralph eyeballs went to look at the sergeant, and I tried to pull back, but I went up and I got him in the eyelid. So he got out of the company and went to the hospital. With that. Mm -hmm. And then, were you injured <clears throat> in any of these? No, no. Okay. And then going through. Uh, where you go through rifle training and the sergeant's with you and a dummy comes up and you fire at him and then you see a pillbox that you gotta throw a hand grenade at. Well, the dummy came up and I fired from the hip and broke it, hit the board it was folded up, and it folded over. Then we came to the, the uh, pillbox and it's up a hill and I'm down here. I said, boy, if I throw this grenade up there and I don't make it, it's gonna roll back down on me. So I decided to throw over it. So I threw all I could to get over it. It went right in. <laughs> I said, wow, I'm glad to get out of that mess. But anyway, those are the things that happened during the training. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, this uh, buddy, did you know him uh, from Ralph, home or? From Princeton. From Princeton. Right. And I had a couple. Jack Bookie was another one who was at Princeton with me. They came down there with me, too. Mm -hmm. And uh, so let's see, anything else interesting happen? Every time we went out in the woods or the swamps, somebody would come back with a snake on his bayonet. <laughs> Snakes were all over the place. We had <clears throat> one, our sergeant told us one Mexican who was in training it that there was no snakes in the air. This Mexican laid down on top of a snake. <laughs> and he was mad as the devil and told the sergeant, you told me there was no snakes. And the sergeant said, can I help it if one comes in? <laughs> <laughs> and we had a guy, a guy from the American Museum of Natural History there, knew all about snakes, and he took that snake, it was a coral snake, not a uh, poisonous one, but and he put them on a branch. He said, Any time they're on a branch, they can't strike you. And he just told us all about snakes. But oh, You need that sort of information in South Oh, yeah. Georgia. Yeah, you couldn't do anything about it, though. <laughs> uh -huh. Then we go out on uh, night maneuvers. <clears throat> And you take your, your squad, I took my squad through, and we were the first squad. So we went out and followed the trail that we were supposed to go to by compass. Came back up to the airfield where airplanes are going down. And I told the guys, I said, we're not going back to that sergeant. He'll give us something else to do. So we had formed a perimeter of defense and just stayed there for about a half an hour. Then we got up and went in. The sergeant said, where have you guys been? I said, well, we got a little lost, but we finally find our way apart. I mean, we got it. <laughs> then another time, we went out to the mortar range to fire mortars, and my squad carried all the mortars out there. We got the mortars out of the weapons pool. We didn't have them. And we took them on out there, and we fired on the range, and did all that stuff. Time to go back in. The lieutenant says, OK, your first squad, carry the mortars back in. I said, wait a minute, lieutenant. I protest, we carried them out. I think another squad ought to carry them back. He said, I said, first squad, carry them. I said, okay, but it's under protest. <laughs> and then <clears throat> that night at uh, formation, where you go through and inspect the rifles and everything, opened my rifle up, a little piece of uh, seed or something blew into it, and the lieutenant saw it and said, okay, your gig, you report to the first sergeant tonight. 
and there was other guys that got gig too, but had to report to the first side. And they got gig. Yeah, a gig gets you. So you got to go and report and do extra duty. And after that, they said the rest of the company fall in. We're going down to the motor pool because the machine guns we turned in from the other day are so dirty that the sergeant down there wants you guys down there cleaning these machine guns. So the rest of the company went down to clean machine guns. I went to the first sergeant with these other guys. He had us cut grass with bayonets and just you know, pull one up. And cut one. And in uh, half an hour, he comes out and says, OK, you guys can go. <laughs> and we went off to the PX. And the rest of the guys were down there cleaning machine guns till midnight. And I told the lieutenant the next morning, thank you, lieutenant. <laughs> and he just laughed. <laughs> Ten weeks. Okay. Okay. Um, so it's, and you went in April, did you say? Went in April. So it's what, June? Uh, summertime now? Yeah, it was about June, July. Okay. So where are you headed to next? Well, I went down to personnel. One was all up. And they said, you can go to OCS school or you can go to Army Specialized Training Program. If you go to the Army Specialized Training Program, you'll get an education, but we can't guarantee you'll become an officer. I says, oh, okay, I'll take the education. So they sent me off to VMI. And VMI. Virginia Military Institute. Right. Which is where? Uh, Lexington, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were taking electrical engineering there. And I went up there, and I was a platoon leader. Then the next two weeks, I was a company commander. Then the battalion commander. Now we had. The Army Specialized Training Reserve companies, two, two platoons of those. Army Specialized Training Reserve, which we were, two platoons, yeah, two platoons of us, then VMI cadets. So we had what they called a regiment. And if you were the, uh, the battalion commander, which I finally got to be, you rotated for regimental commander. And all the troops would pass and review every Friday. And We'd select which ones were the straightest, the best looking ones, and all that. And we had swords. We carried swords. All the officers did, did the swords manual. So I took electrical engineering up until a point. And this was, let's see, August was the end of the war, August of 45. And they terminated the program after that when we finished out. So that, was that uh, August, September? That was about October, I guess it was, yeah. Um, do you remember the end of the war? Where were you? How did you hear about it? Okay, I was at Princeton. I mean, I was at VMI, yeah. excuse me, at VMI. How did you hear about the end of the war? Uh, through the news media and whatnot. And we all got the night off and we went out drinking, naturally. And some civilian picked us up and took us around in his car, and he got drunk, so one of our guys had to drive the car. And we left him sleeping outside of VMI dormitories, and we all went in. <laughs> but we all celebrated that. So lots of celebration. Uh -huh. um, did you uh, keep up with your mother and your brother during this time? With my mother, yeah. Your brother? Yeah. Did she come and did she visit? Did you get to go home? Oh, no. No, no. Didn't get to go home until after I left uh, VMI. And they sent me to, uh, what did they name it for it? Uh, it was a quartermaster corps. Uh, anyway, it was in Richmond, Virginia. I'll think of it in a minute. And they sent me to typing school. Why? I did engineering. Now I'm a typist. So I went to typing school and got put in a uh, termination center, which is the guys are coming back from overseas and being discharged. And we type up all the papers and all the stuff. That was what? Well, um, tell me what the procedure would be when you were typing these termination papers up. Were you sitting at a desk with a GI there? Or? Yeah, with a GI there and a service record. Mm -hmm. And then we copied this stuff out of the service record into that. And he could see it, and he had to sign for it. And that included his discharge papers and all the other papers that go with them. 
Um, was this something that was interesting to you, or was it just tedious? Uh, it was just routine. I was interested to see some of these guys or what their history was. And, uh, was there anybody in particular that was an interesting story coming back, or was it? No, not really. Not really. <laughs> just routine. Just routine. Okay. And uh, I forgot how this happened, but they wanted me to stay there in the quartermaster car. And I said, no, nah, I want to go overseas. So uh, they decided I'd go overseas. So they sent me to the Air Force up at Fort Totten, Long Island. Fort what? Totten, T-O-T-T-E-N. It was a nice little fort. And uh, going in there, I find, after a couple of times at Reveille, I found out they didn't know who the heck was in Reveille formation. So me and this other, I can't remember his name now, but he was born in Argentina. He was an American. And uh, so we all went off to the Red Cross and it had coffee and donuts while everybody else fell in because what they do is say, you, you, you go over to the office at barracks, fix their beds, clean up the place. You, you, you go do this. You, you, you go on KP. So we just stayed away from all that stuff. <laughs> we went over to the Red Cross. And uh, I got a pass to go see an aunt who lived in Jackson Heights, Long Island, and also got a pass to go home see my mother. While I was gone, my mother, all my buddies that were with me, shipped out. So I came back, they were all gone. But I left the next couple of days, went up to Iceland. To Iceland is what's your place Okay. Okay. We flew out of LaGuardia Airport and uh, went to uh, Nova Scotia, of course, you couldn't fly direct. So we stopped at Nova Scotia. And this was in January. The cold month. 46? Are we in 46? Uh, 46, right. January 46. 46. And we had a, a uh, prop feathering pump failure up there, so we had to stay overnight. What kind of failure? Prop feathering prop pump. feather. In other words, it takes the propeller and turns it into the airstream so you don't have any drag in case you lose an engine. So we uh, stayed overnight in that cold place, too and then off to Iceland the next day. That takes 16 hours to get there in an old prop engine. And we come into Iceland, and I don't know why, but I was the only guy that got off there. I don't know where the plane was going after that. And they put me in a transit barracks, a coal Quonset hut. I'm the only guy there. Got an oil stove I knew nothing about. Coal. <sighs> I spent the night there wondering, what's going to happen? <laughs> And the next day I went through personnel, and I got assigned to the base adjutant's office, the command adjutant's office. I was going to take over after a master sergeant who was going to get discharged in two weeks. So I had two weeks of training, took me through the files, said, if anything comes up, here's what you do. Now, the command adjutant's office, everything that comes in, all correspondence had to come into my hands or my group saying, hey, I opened up, and then we'd run our first endorsement. If it was an engineering situation, we sent it to the engineers. MP, we sent it to the MPs. And all that stuff came back to us with the answers, and if anything was going out of the base, went into the adjutant's office for signature. So we control the whole base, engineers, MPs, personnel, uh, legal. Oh, legal was a lot of fun. Yeah. They had these... They had the sheriff come down from one of the Iceland counties to pull a man off an airplane who was going back home, and he had fathered a baby, and he had to pay, he had to sign up to pay for care for that baby. So he had all kinds of things like that. Then the MPs, any MP doc would come through us, and we'd endorse it to the company commander to take appropriate action. And then it would come back to us telling us what happened, and we just put it in a file. Well, I had one buddy, Scotty, came out of Tennessee. Uh, he was in the motor pool. He had a staff car. He could drive any place in town. And he got picked up by the MPs. He called me and says, hey, I got picked up by the MPs. Can you take care of it? I said, yeah, I'll take care of it. So when the docket came through, it disappeared. I don't know where it went. But anyway, nothing happened. And then... Uh, 
One time I was coming back to work from the mess hall, and the wind was blowing, and I had my head down like that, and this captain stopped me. He says, didn't you see me? How come you didn't salute me? I said, I'm sorry, sir. I didn't see you. The wind was blowing. I had my head down. He, so he <coughs> read the riot act to me about saluting an officer and all that. I says, OK. What he didn't know is I put out the duty roster for all the officers. I put him on weekend coverage on convoy duty, officer of the day, and whatever else came up. He was on weekend after weekend after weekend. <laughs> and I was in the adjutant's office one day, and he comes into the adjutant's office and was complaining about being on weekend duty. So I snuck out, <laughs> went to my office, and I heard the lieutenant the agent tell me, well, go see Sergeant Boyce. He'll explain to you why you're on duty like that. So he came out, to me. and I think he recognized me, but I want to show him. He says, how come I'm on weekend duty all this time? I says, well, you know, we're short on offices. You know, your name comes up, your name comes up. I said, but I'll try and keep you off of weekend duty this week. <laughs> and I did. I didn't put him on weekend duty for another four weeks. <laughs> but uh, that's the kind of power the command adjutant offers. Of course, we control everything that happened around the base. Then another time, I had a weather officer, lieutenant, first lieutenant, wanted to get orders cut so he can go to Greenland because he had something to do up there. So I kept putting them off because we cut the orders for moving people around. Then. And this was in the, the summertime. The sun was out all the time. And we went to town. We had the command car. And some of us went to town, and we spent a little time down at the Red Cross and whatnot. Then we were coming back and coming around. And these are all dirt roads up there. And I was coming around, we met a jeep, and we kind of contacted each other. We cut his tire a little bit. So we were out looking at it. And all it was a cut tire. And here comes his staff car. It pulls up. And here comes his, these officers come out and say, what's going on here? Oh, we had an accident. I guess we'd better fill out an accident report, he says. It, uh, and I recognized I says, Lieutenant, I forgot his name. He's the guy that was trying to get his orders cut. I said, I'm Sergeant Boys. I was going to cut, go back to the base, and tomorrow I was going to cut your orders and get you off to Greenland. He said, oh, you were. And he talked to this corporal who was driving the, the uh, jeep. He said, Corporal, do you think you can tell Motorpool uh, uh, how, that you cut the tire on a rock? And the corporal said, oh, yeah, no problem, no problem. We can take care of that. And he said, well, no sense filling out an accident report. <laughs> so we cleared that one up. <laughs> and I went in on Sunday and cut this guy's order and got him out on Monday <laughs> off to Greenland. You were one powerful man there. Oh, yeah. Well, I was a chief, uh, sorry, I was a a private in January and a staff sergeant by June. I was going to get to be, and the adjutant general, he was on the, the promotion board. He says, as long as you're doing the job, I'm going to get you the rank. But when I got to, to become staff sergeant, the military froze tech and master ratings because all these officers were bouncing back into sergeant's position. So that happened in June, and I said, gee, there goes my future in the military. Can't go nowhere. And my time was going to be up in October. And I told the lieutenant I was going to take discharge. So uh, they brought in a second lieutenant who was a fighter pilot to replace me. So I gave him a couple of weeks on <laughs> how to run this. <laughs> and he, he was a feisty little guy <laughs> with a little mustache. <laughs> but anyway, he replaced me. And American Overseas Airlines was a contract operator uh, doing contract flying for the military. And they had a place there at the base where they handled their planes coming through, because most of those planes were contract carriers. And they offered me a job. And so I took the job. And I got uh, discharged up there. I tell you what, before we talk about being discharged, tell me, um, you told me some of the um, sort of events of... Um, the funny stuff. The funny stuff. Tell me, um, you know, what did you wear? I'm guessing it's pretty cold. Um, was there, um, you said that your first night up there, you had a box with a... 
oil furnace or something. Yeah. Um, tell me about day, you know, the living conditions and oh, they weren't. eating and did you get packages from home? Tell me some of that sort of stuff. No. Well, we ate in the mess hall. They had pretty good food. And what we do when we're on KP or something, and they, got, they bring one of these big canned hams. They'd steal it and bring it home to the hut. It was about, what was it? Uh, six of us in a Quonset hut. And we had this big oil stove. And the oil was piped in from outside. And that was supposed to keep us warm, but it didn't do too good. And one time, one of the guys decided to disconnect the carburetor. And the next, and while we were sleeping, the next thing you know, the oil came up that where it was almost going to overflow into the hut, and the flames were up there. And we had to cut that somewhere kind of off. Man, I was a little worried about that thing. But anyway, it was a little chilly. Now, technically, the average temperature for Iceland in January is 48 degrees. It gets cold, it warms up. You have the Gulf Stream off base. And in July, it's 70. That's the average temperature. I went swimming one, one time in the summertime in the ocean. And boy, it was cold. I started feeling uh, a tingling. Yeah, like I was going to quit. You know? And so I got the heck out, quit. Never went in again. But, uh, and then for entertainment, we. we Draw out 45s and go on over to the dump and shoot rats. So that'd give us something to do. Then we go to town and go to the Red Cross to the dances and things. Uh, but the food was pretty good. I can't complain about that. But see, when I got discharged, I I had to take what was it? One month? Yeah, 30 days terminal leave, and I couldn't eat in the in the enlisted man's mess hall. I had to eat in the office, and I couldn't change get out of my uniform. I had to wear my uniform. So I was the only sergeant eating in the officer's mess hall. And they were supposed to bill me for what? When I ate there. But I never got a bill. So I got the food for free. Mm -hmm. Until finally my uh, terminal leave was up. Then I could go and sit in uniform. And then I could legally eat in the mess hall there. But, you know. And um, uh, what about back home? Uh, correspondence from your mom? Did oh, you yeah. Letters? Did you send letters? Letters home? back at home. Did she send you care packages? Was there? No, but she sent my civilian clothes. <laughs> and I got into that. Uh huh. But, uh, All right, so when you were discharged, did you come straight back? No, I stayed right up there. Oh, you, you stayed in Iceland to yeah. work? Yeah. That's right. Stayed in Iceland to work for the American Overseas Airlines. Oh, okay. So that mm -hmm. was in Iceland. Right. And that was in ground operations, mm -hmm. which was all the uh, messages coming in and out mm -hmm. with the airplane. <clears throat> and how long did you work for them? A year, because then the military left, and American Overseas Airlines, Iceland Airport Corporation, took over. The military got out, so that American was running the whole base, taking care of it. They had all these civilians come in and take over. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was still down there in ground operations. But then a year later, I guess that was in October 49, I, I got discharged in 46, October 46. I stayed in the reserve for three years. I'm digressing. I got out of the reserve six months before Korea started. But anyway, back to American. American, and then Lockheed competed for that operation up there to take over what they were doing. So Lockheed won the contract and took over operating the base known as Keplevent Airport. Spell that. K-E-F-V-I-K. Keplavik. K -E -F -V -I -K. I forgot. But anyway. Uh, the name of the field was Meeks Fields. The Air Force always names fields after the first guy to get killed on. So uh, Captain Meeks was the first guy to crash and got killed. But uh, Lockheed took over, and I stayed. And then you're, so you're, you kept doing the same thing? Mm -hmm. I transferred over to Lockheed. You transferred to Lockheed, okay. 
And I forget when all this happened, but eventually I wanted to be a mechanic. And I got into maintenance. Got out of ground operation, got into maintenance. I started off with clerical work there. And I knew all the books and all the stuff. Then I got a, an opportunity to be a junior mechanic and worked as a junior mechanic, working on constellations, DC-4s, DC-3s, de Havilland's. Uh, con yeah, I said constellations. Oh, and Boeing 737, and Lancaster bombers and all that stuff. But we worked at an airplane that came in that had a problem, we'd fix it. And uh, let's see, we had some fun time. Yeah, we had some fun time. We'd have a C-54 come taxiing in, and he was riding his brakes, so his brakes were smoking. And we were at the terminal there waiting for him. He came the brakes are smoking, the fire department comes in, oh, we got a fire. And we stood in front of those wheels and said, don't you dare put anything on. <laughs> we'll take care of that problem. We took the shields off and cooled it off. They'd, they'd crack the whole wheel if they put some of their CO2 on it. So we had to fight those guys. And then we had a, squat, uh, a wing of F-86s flying through, coming out of Greenland. Iceland, and then England. And it was on New Year's. And the colonel came down in advance and said, now you would bring him in, go ahead, have a good time. So we all had a good time. And come uh, 8 o'clock in the morning, they said, OK, everybody down to the hangar. Those airplanes are coming in. And we said, he said he wouldn't bring them in. So I put two beers in my pocket and went down to the hangar. They gave me the Glee, the Klee track, which is a tractor. It says, any of their airplanes block the runway, you go push them off, no matter what. Just get them off the runway, because these airplanes keep coming in one after another. They lost one in flight coming down. And the pilot bailed out. And he was in about, when you land in the, in the ocean, and he didn't have a survival suit on, you only got three minutes and you had it. And the weather ship got to him, but it was too late. So he, he was gone. So he lost one. But anyway, all these airplanes are sitting around there. Then the next day, they take off going to England. Then the English come over with vampire jets, and they all landed. And they all went to America. <laughs> but that was a good operation. I stayed there until every time the clerk in the maintenance department quit. I had to go in there and do all the administrative stuff. And I'd always lose connection with what was going out on the flight line, what new airplanes, new systems. Then finally, the military came back in at the Korean War period. So that was around, I believe it was March of 50, 51? Yeah. No? 51? OK. But the military came back in. And I decided to go home. The major in the maintenance group wanted me to sign on with him and be a civilian and take care of all his aircraft maintenance stuff. I says, uh, I'm sorry, Major. I saw the military leave. You guys are coming back. I got to get out. <laughs> so Lockheed offered us jobs uh, wherever we wanted to go. They offered Georgia. But I swore I'd never come back to Georgia as long as I lived because it was so hot over there at Camp Court in Georgia. So I took Long Island at uh, the United States, Idlewild Airport. And there was a flight line mechanic over there. We took care of military airplanes too. Then they were lacking work. It was getting kind of boring. We had a union. I didn't want to join the union because they wouldn't give us any seniority at all for working for Lockheed. So we told him that. And this was Jim Fox, myself, Freddie Gruder. I forgot who the other guys were. But we eventually got an idea to go to Iran, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia with Transocean Airlines. So we all signed up for that operation. And is this through Lockheed? No. Oh, this is something else. Yeah, okay. we quit Lockheed. We went up to, okay. to Hartford, Connecticut, and went to work for them up there. And we wanted to go overseas. 
But Mossadegh was creating problems in Iran, and he swore they had cholera over there, so he didn't want any Americans in. So that thing folded up. So there I was up there trying to fix airplanes for uh, Transocean Airlines. They had pretty sloppy maintenance. So. so my boss from Iceland, he went down to Georgia. He kept calling me, wanted me to come down there. So finally I gave in, and I left in January again, when I was old enough, with uh, four inches of snow on the top of my car. Went straight on down, didn't lose the snow till I got to Virginia, and drove on into Atlanta. And went out there and signed up with Lockheed again. And this time as a, a production analyst, we were working airplanes, uh, modifying B-29 airplanes to go into the uh, Korean War. And so I was on that line taking care of those. I was on the swing shift, which was nice. Oh, tell me something about, all right, I'm, I'm sorry, let me back up. Are you in uh, Marietta working at Lockheed now on these co planes yeah. for Korea? Right. Right. Um, tell me something about the airplanes. I mean, what, what made them different? Was this something new? Was there anything new about these airplanes from World yeah. War II? <clears throat> they were all sitting in the desert down there in New Mexico. They had all been mothballed and put away. So all the systems needed to be checked out, updated, new parts put in, all that. So <clears throat> the pilots would fly the airplanes in. They'd fix the airplanes just good enough to one-time flight to come into uh, Marietta. They'd bring them in there, and we'd take care of maintenance on them. Well, eventually I got transferred into Materiel, same program, and I had the the bond room where all the rejected materials come into me and I got room. So we had that program. Then when the B-29s finished, we had building B-47s. And I was still a material on that. And then we started the C-130A. And I had material for that, too. Then I went to the Jetstar. That was a new airplane, my favorite. We started all the way up from engineering development to everything. And I went into program coordination. That's where you take the engineering and schedule the engineering. You schedule the planners to make the plans for the tools and the plans for the parts. You schedule materiel to get the materials in to support a certain area of the airplane. And you go through the engineering flight test program with them and finally start delivery on And that was a nice program, I like that. But... we had some audio difficulties and so we are uh, re-recording the end of John's interview. John, we were talking about you had uh, how you met your wife, BJ. So would you tell us again the story about you moved to Atlanta, moved into a boarding house and how you met your wife? Okay, I came into Atlanta January of 52. And I found a boarding house, 1293 Peachtree Street, across the way from the Fine Arts now. It, uh, it, it was finally torn down in the Strickler building, medical building is there. But anyway, we, the lady ran the house. She had about 20 or 25 people there. What was the lady's name? Do you remember? Oh, gee. That's okay. I'll think about it. All right. But, it, but she had an annex in the back where all the men stayed, and she had the main house where all the women stayed. And she served breakfast and dinner during the work week, and on Saturday she served breakfast only. And uh, we would go out and eat or do whatever we do. She also had a, a front room where we had a big TV console, and we'd sit there and watch TV and whatnot. Then on Saturday nights, uh, she would let us 
move the tables out of the way and have dances in the dining room. Or we could ha we had spaghetti and meatball dinners, and she let us keep our beer in the refrigerator, and we had a lot of fun. In fact, she had a big waiting room to get into her place because everybody heard how much fun they were having there. And we had a good group. Well, BJ came in around, if I believe it was either November, December of 52. I was laying on the couch in the front room there watching TV, and this girl comes in carrying her bags, and she goes over to the first front, second front room and goes in there. And so he said, well, that's a new girl moving in. And I said to these two young Marines that were sitting there watching TV with me, I said, why don't you two guys go help that girl move in? And sure enough, they got up and they went out and they helped this girl move into her room. And uh, I didn't pay too much attention to her for a while. Then. She had a convertible, a mercury convertible, a 49 mercury convertible, I believe. And while it was parked out on Peachtree one time, somebody slashed the top of her. And we were all pretty upset about that. But she got it fixed. And she went to work for Eastern Airlines. That's how I got involved with her. Because I, I had been in the aviation business, airline business, and I knew all the codes for the different uh, cities. And somehow she found out about that. So she asked me to help her with the codes. So I helped her work the codes. Out. And then eventually uh, we got a little closer. And I took her to a drive-in theater one time in my car. And I believe that was something like October, maybe. And what kind of car did you have? I had a, a 49 Chevrolet Coupe Blue. And we went to the movie. And as you're supposed to do in driving movies, we started doing a little naked. <laughs> then, then eventually we kept going with each other. And in February of 54, I gave him an engagement. So, so how long? So. How long did she live in the house before you all? About a year. About a year before you sort of took a fancy to her. Right. And then you dated for six months? Probably about that. And then you proposed? Then I, yeah. Okay. And then she went home to Hazelhurst to get ready for the wedding. Mm -hmm. And uh, that happened in September, so from February to September. Mm -hmm. I think she didn't go home till around June. She quit her job. And um, you said that you have one son. I have one son, John Ethan Boys, and he's married to Ginebra, mm -hmm. Brummett Boys. And you have a grandson. I have a grandson named John Edgar Winslow Boys. Mm -hmm. And how old is he now? He's eight years old and in the third grade. Mm -hmm. And we get to see him every Friday night, just about. Mm -hmm. In fact, we had him last night. And uh, we won't have him tonight, but we'll have him tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. um, and then my. Okay, go ahead. Well, do you remember the next question? The view of the world. The view of the world, that's, yes. Okay. I had a good view of the world. I had a good education, too. The good view of the world was when I was up in Iceland. Uh, that was World War II. And then eventually into Vietnam. Now, what happened in 1951, there were Russian ships off the coast of uh, Iceland. And between Iceland and England is the avenue that all the submarines from Russia go through to get to the Atlantic Ocean and do whatever they wanted to do. So that became a good place for the military to observe what was going on. So they came back in, in uh, what did I say, July of 51. And the head of the maintenance guy, he wanted me to stay there, as I mentioned before, as part of his administrative guy in the hangar. But I decided I had to leave. I said, I saw the military come in. I saw the military leave. I'm going. So I left. But anyway, the Vietnam War started in, I believe it was March of 52. No, 51, excuse me, March of 51. And that's why these Russian ships were off the coastline. But the military came in. Now, my view of the world was like this. In the Bay of Pigs, I was working at Lockheed. And we had 
47s we were modifying for the military, and they exercised us to get them out and support the Bay of Pig. So I was called by the material director. I was in program control, and he asked me to become the material representative on the swing ship to make sure everything worked fine as far as material was concerned. And I said I would. So they sent me home, and I tried to get a nap, but I couldn't go to sleep. Then comes 4 o'clock time to, to go to work, and they told me, okay, the program's all over. We don't need to do that. So I went home again. <laughs> but we had a good view of the military. In Vietnam, they had some 600 C-130s. The original C-130 was a transporter. Go up, take your cargo, and land. But the military was making an, a, an attack airplane. It would come in and down like that and bounce. In fact, they tried to do that down in uh, a base in Mississippi, and the airplane hit, and the wing went down that way and came back up and kept going off the airplane. So we had to modify 600 military airplanes and replace the wings so they would stand and attack landing and a maximum takeoff. So that's what we did for that one. Now, all our airplanes are military support airplanes for cargo. Uh, 48 countries operate the C-130, and that's the A model to the H model. And the J model was the last one I worked on, and we just finished that one up before I retired. And they have, uh, when we were developing it, we didn't have too many customers, but today they have delivered over 101 of those airplanes, and they got 60 more on a quarter. So they're doing pretty good. But the C-130 uh, was the small cargo airplane. The C-141 was the next cargo airplane. It was two times the size of the C-130. Then came the C-5 cargo aircraft. It was four times the size of the C-141. The C-141 and the C-130, they're still operating today. I think the last C-141 I just read was going to retire in 2005. So we'll see if that happens. But that airplane has been in service since February of 64. February 64. So it's been in there 40 years, just about. And the C-5, it's been, when did it go out? It went out, something like that. That's when my son was born, okay. But it's still operating. All these airplanes are still operating. And Lockheed builds the P-3 Naval aircraft, and they have a lot of those airplanes in the Navy up in Iceland to keep an eye on that passageway where the submarines come through. They also built the SA-3, which is a small airplane. In fact, it's the airplane President Bush landed on the carrier when he came back from from Iraq. And so that airplane's still on operations. So Lockheed has a good history of building military airplanes. Now, and you told me that um, you received uh, some awards from Lockheed. Yeah, true. Tell me about the awards. Well, I received one award for C-130 Man of the Month. And that meant I was the best guy on the C-130. And they gave me a C-130 model, which is about well, I'd say 18 inches long. I got that at home. Then the company honored me and several other people for uh, the best of the people at Lockheed. Before, and I forgot what year that was. And they made a speech about it. The MC was a friend of mine. I knew him pretty well. knew him a long time. And he says, well, we're going to give an award to a man who happened to be with the Wright brothers when they made their first flight. And he rambled on about some more things I did in the master scheduling world and the program control world, and then announced my name. And I had to go up there, and the president, Lockheed, presented me with this award. And he said, it's about time you got this. Mm -hmm. Well, which is an interesting comment, considering the 100th anniversary of the Wright brothers was That's just true. a couple of days ago. That's right. Uh -huh. Yeah. I, if I had been there, if it would have worked. If you had been there, I think it would have worked. I think so, too. Um, was there anything else? I think that's... Yeah. Towards the end there, I was no longer a manager of master schedule. I became a specialist because we brought it. And from then on, all the guys that became my boss, I had raised up. They had worked for me at one time or another. 
And I wound up in proposal work on the F-22, and we won that proposal. And those airplanes are being built now out of hockey. I also worked in research and development, where you look at materials, you look at processes, and you look at things down the road that's going to come about. And that was all very the black hole group? Then I worked in the black hole group, which you're not supposed to mention that part. It's really the secret group. And I was on several secret programs. But one of the best ones I was on, we went out to Burbank. And it was over the holiday season. The military always likes the contractor to work over the, the holidays while they take time off. But anyway, we so were which on this. holiday? This was Thanksgiving. Yeah, on Thanksgiving, Lockheed had all the people working out there bring their wives and children out and have Thanksgiving with their husbands and with Lockheed. And Lockheed footed the bill. And my son was out there, and he had his own private room. And he was 17. I rented a car for him so he could take his mother around when I was born. But that, that was a good trip there, too. And while we were out there, you know, they built an F-117, the secret airplane, in those days. And they would tell us, you guys got to get out of here by 8 o'clock tonight because the whole place is going to be blacked out if you can't do anything. And we'd go on home. We'd be over at the Hilton across the way from uh, Burbank Airport, and we could hear the C-5 coming in. Heard the C-5 landing, because C-5 has a special light. And we figured they were rolling one of these airplanes up in there and taking it out to Nevada for testing. So that was interesting. How long were you out in Burbank? Burbank? We spent about 10 weeks out there on the proposal. Mm -hmm. And uh, usually after four weeks, you can bring uh, your wife out there. Usually you didn't go home, you just brought your wife up there and you stayed working and she, she sat around the hotel or whatever you wanted to go. But uh, my son had a good, well, they went to the movie places out there and everything. My son became an astronaut, put on a uniform and he had him fly on Earth. about all we lost. Can you think of anything else? That no, I think that's that that's lost? about it. Yeah. Well, and again, I want to say, John, thank you very much for coming in and taking the time to, and now to re-record. I hope your, it works. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Okay.